to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hey, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie. Welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. I hope you guys have been enjoying the episodes. We really appreciate everybody that has downloaded the episodes and especially the people that have left your reviews on Apple Podcasts. That really helps us uh, get seen out there and share our message with the world. So I'm super excited about today's guest, uh, another physician, Dr. Ted Naiman. And uh, him and I were just chatting right before we got on. He just moved and we were we were talking about how awful it is to move. I hope you guys sympathize. I, just, I can't stand even packing a suitcase and unpacking it, let alone <laughs> a lot of boxes. But uh, Dr. Naiman is a board certified family medicine physician uh, in the Department of Primary Care at a leading medical center in Seattle. And he told me he just moved to Tacoma his research and medical practice is <laughs> all yes, focused is. on it the sure practical is, implementation of diet and exercise for health optimization. He has an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and utilizes engineering principles when dealing with complex systems like human health and nutrition. And it is complex, isn't it, Doc? <laughs> yes, it is. It sure is, doctor. But at the same time, it's actually kind of simple, right? I feel like as humans, we try to take really simple things and just make them complex. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, uh, it can be simple. It might not be easy, but yeah, we're, I'm trying to simplify it. That's part of my job. I feel like. Yeah. Anything that's worth, worth having is not easy. Okay. Well tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, like you said, I have a mechanical engineering degree and then I just kind of went to medical school on a whim, uh, and got out. I finished my residency about 20 years ago and I've just been a primary care doctor, mostly here in the Seattle, greater Seattle area for 20 years. Uh, but I'm super excited about diet and exercise. And that's just been my focus. You know, it seems to be so powerful at uh, creating health and preventing disease. And uh, I feel like back when I was just using medication, I just wasn't that effective. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that diet and exercise is probably the most important factor when it comes to health. And so that's what I've been focused on most of my career. Yeah. I think it's interesting when you talk to patients, it's like, they don't want to hear it. Right. When you're like, okay, well, your nutrition is super important. But when we look at studies, even on, you know, medications, you know, like with a blood pressure medication, a clinically significant change might be like 10% improvement or, you know, a five, a five point improvement in their systolic blood pressure. But with lifestyle intervention, we're talking like 70, 80% improvement in like every symptom. I mean, I could sit in front of a patient all day long and explain why each symptom pertains to their, their poor diet or lack of sleep or lack of movement or do you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, a number needed to treat. We're always like, okay, I could prescribe you an ACE inhibitor. And maybe after I do that 300 times, I'm going to prevent one cardiovascular event or something like that. Right. And it's just depressing. I mean, it's just, uh, so, so I think wielding diet and exercise, if you're a physician is just so much more powerful and so much more rewarding. Um, and the, <clears throat> the bang for your buck is so much higher than medication for most of the chronic diseases that we face. And so I, I honestly think if I didn't have the lifestyle part dialed in, I probably would have burned out by now, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And burnout, I mean, especially in this, you know, COVID pandemic burnout is happening left and right to nurses and doctors. And the traditional system is just not built to help cure chronic disease. And, uh, you know, we could get into the politics of it. There's a lot of money to be made and, and pharma and things like that. But I, I don't think doctors are evil. I don't think that, <laughs> you know, you and I went to medical school um, to, you know, try to just make a ton of money off people. Like, I think we truly want people to feel and function their best. Um, okay. So you said you went to medical school on a whim. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how somebody with an engineering background then goes into medicine and then develops this like insane passion for nutrition and exercise. Like, has that always been part of your life, like fitness and wellness or like, tell me how that happened. Yeah. I, I mean, the, <clears throat> the medical school thing really was just a whim. I basically never took general biology, uh, took the MCAT pretty cold and then just took a six week organic chemistry after I graduated, right? Like weeks before I started medical school. And that's how I kind of shoved it all in there. Um, but I, I just, you know, I just decided, oh, you know, engineering is 
uh, I, I live up here near Boeing, which is this big um, employer of engineers, right? So everybody in my program went to work for Boeing doing aerospace. And uh, Boeing just keeps laying off engineers every couple of years. And so all of these engineers would be out of work and getting laid off. And I just felt like I wanted something with more job security. And I figured, hey, everybody's always sick. So why not medical school? <laughs> And that's how I ended up in medical school. I had zero passion for diet and exercise at that time, like none at all. And this is something that basically my patients introduced me because I could see um, patients like the, like some people would walk into my clinic and they would be in amazing health, just like they look just fantastic. They're just ripped and jacked and their numbers are perfect and uh, everything's great. And then somebody else would just like shuffle in and they're, they've got one foot in the grave. Their problem list is like 50 things. They've got like 30 meds. And I'm trying to parse out what's the difference between these super healthy people and these horribly unhealthy people. And, and at some point, I really realized that it all comes down to diet and exercise. I mean, there, there might be a tiny genetic component loading the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger every time. And so uh, you know, once uh, once my eyes were opened by my patients to how radically different your phenotype can be, um, despite your genotype based on your diet and exercise, I just got hooked. And so I'm like, OK, so I know this is a big deal. And then I wanted to know what were the levers you could pull to get these great health outcomes. And I've just been researching diet and exercise ever since. Interesting. Okay, so for people on YouTube, they can see you. Our podcast people can't, but obviously, Dr. Naaman is, he's fit. He's fit, you guys. He obviously walks the walk and, and doesn't just talk the talk. So where where was your health at? Like, so as your patients are starting, you're starting to have this realization with medicine that this is really simple. We have to focus on, on lifestyle. Like, were you always fit at, or... <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, you can see my before and afters online and I was completely unfit. I was one of these skinny fat people, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Who, who looked like I wasn't obese, but my body fat was really, really high and I was very unhealthy and uh, I have managed to turn all that around. And so, yeah, I didn't start out that way. I was not born on the finish line for sure. Uh, I, I will say I was never, you know, morbidly obese or anything like that, but I was definitely yeah. Yeah. I have a similar story. I was a collegiate athlete. And so I, from the outside looked pretty healthy, ended up, um, getting diagnosed with prediabetes, hypothyroidism, PCOS. I mean, like all the things that my patients, you know, experience and, but it was so subtle and it was like, just believable that like, you know, the little bit of anxiety and fatigue and things like that was just life, you know, being a doctor and married with three kids. And had I not asked to get my labs checked, I would have never known. And so, um, now I've, turned everything around. I'm like, you know, the fittest I've been, the leanest I've ever been in my adult life and feel and function on an entirely new level and really just try to try to, uh, you know, implement that for my patients. So, uh, you co-authored a book called the P E diet. Tell us what it is about these ratios. Where did this concept come from? Right, right. So the P E diet is basically an attempt to boil down everything you, everything you want to do with your diet directionally into one single metric. Um, and that's protein versus non-protein energy. So I kind of looked at all these diets where people are successful. You know, we have success stories on low carb and on low fat and paleo and plant-based and carnivore. And, and the one thing that all of these diets have in common is they increase protein percentage and nutrient density. And then they decrease some in some form non-protein energy. It might be a carbohydrate reduction, it might be a fat reduction, it might be a reduction of both. Uh, but in any case, proteins going up, carbs and fats are going down. And so I came up with this PE concept as just sort of a way to simplify it for people and, and a way to visualize, you know, the protein in your diet versus the non-protein energy being carbs or fat. Um, and uh, this kind of allowed me to escape the dogma of like the low carb world. You know, I've been low carb forever and I do like low carb, but I've seen way too many black swans of people having amazing transformations on low fat diets. And I realized that it kind of transcends carbs versus fat. And it really comes down to this protein versus energy 
um, phenomenon. And so that's kind of where I came up with it. And it's really just a, it's just a framework. It's just a mental construct. It's just a way of looking at your diet and sort of dividing it mentally into protein, uh, which tracks with nutrients versus non-protein energy, which is basically just energy calories. So why, well, okay. Uh, I want to talk about the protein and, and, or excuse me, the, the fat and carb thing. Cause I, um, obviously had prediabetes and now I do a lot of ketogenic therapy. I'm a, I did the board certification. I, find that low carb diets help women with a lot of problems, right? PCOS, you know, across the board. But I totally agree with you that at the end of the day, it's really just controlling energy calories. And I view carbs and fat as energy calories, never spare protein. Um, but I have seen, and, and most of them kind of came from the bodybuilding world, you know, chronically low fat diets and just low testosterone, low estradiol levels. And so I always say you have to pick which horse to ride. And I, I think for most people, they're going to benefit from getting the energy calories from fat, you know, because our cellular, you know, the lipid membranes are literally made from fat. Sex hormones are made from cholesterol. Um, and so I'm, I'm a fan there, but I'm interested to like hear your opinion. How does one, like a listener decide, you know, can they figure out how to balance energy calories? Is one better than the other? How does it, is it genetics? Is it well, okay. So if you read the PE diet, I mean, it's, it's a very low carb book. It's a, it's a very low, we present it as a fairly low carb thing. And, and I, I think that the people who are doing the very best are usually restricting carbs to some degree compared to the standard American diet. Um, I, I also feel that carbs are optional. Um, fat is not optional. So if you're cutting anything to zero, it would have to be carbohydrate and not fat. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, while I do look at it pretty much right down the center calorically, um, typically grams of fat or grams of carbs, you know, might differ in some situations, but you can't go on too low of fat of diet. I basically never recommend people try to go less than 30% of calories if they're on a maintenance level calories. Um, and even if you're extremely cutting, you wouldn't want to go south of maybe 30 or 40 grams a day. But uh, basically... And from the PE framework, you're going to want to reduce your carbohydrate intake, but you're also going to want to be really careful with added fats, refined fats, empty calorie fats, all of your uh, butter and your heavy cream and your oils and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of with you. I, I, I'm, I've started out as a very low carb advocate 20 years ago, and I've, I remain low carb. Um, I, I would describe myself as a moderately low carb person you know what i mean so i might eat you know the book suggests maybe 100 grams of carbs a day i might eat you know 150 grams a day if i'm doing a ton of cardio and even then i tend to window it so i'm doing it like a cyclical ketogenic diet with a daily frequency but uh yeah i i think that you're right fat is something that you don't want to go too low on uh but you also don't want to be butter chugging and, and, and mm -hmm. honestly I, part of how i got to the pe diet is seeing people on zero carb diets who still weren't getting where they want to go you know everybody goes on a strict keto diet and loses 20 pounds instantly and feels way better and then they just basically stall out really hard because it comes down to fat balance and if the grams of fat you eat uh, is greater than the grams of fat you're burning you're pretty much not going to lose anything so the pe diet is a way of like further fine-tuning your your diet, whether it's low fat or low carb. Yeah. That's why I love your ratios. These P and, and you have to go see Dr. Naiman. He has the greatest like infographics and these little charts that kind of show you on this like spectrum of like how much protein, you know, to energy is in these, in these different foods. And I love it because uh, I completely agree with you. I've seen people that go low carb or ketogenic and they're constantly eating like nuts and cheese. I always say like those are the kryptonite for most people because um, they're easy to consume a lot of them. They're very calorie dense, right? But they don't have a lot of protein. It's basically like all fat calories and, and fat is the most calorically, you know, it has nine kcals compared to protein and carbs with four. And so it, it adds up a lot quicker. And, and if you're not literally measuring, you know, if you're just like pouring an oil or something into a dish, if you're not literally measuring the tablespoons, um, you can, you can get in trouble with, with your calories. And I think that's why a lot of people do see initial results and, and, uh, and then plateau all the time. Okay. So can you have too much protein? How does one determine that? Uh, it's basically impossible. 
So <clears throat> you almost can't eat too, too much protein if you try. You know, in 20 years of medical practice, I've never looked at anyone and said you're eating too much protein. Uh, we have these studies where people are you know, eating hundreds of grams of protein uh, for long periods of time and nothing bad seems to happen to them. It doesn't seem to negatively affect your kidney or your liver or your bones or any of these things that historically people were afraid of. So no, you really almost can't eat too much protein. Now, if you do try to eat 100% of your calories from protein, you'll actually be starving out of your mind, no matter, even if you have unlimited access to protein. <clears throat> and that's rabbit starvation, where you have, you know, uh, all the lean protein you want, but you're still just super hungry. And that's because it's so hard for your body to extract energy calories out of protein <clears throat> that you almost can't keep up. And so you, you're literally going to have to eat some carbs and fats because you're going to be starving. Enough. So go ahead and try to eat too much protein. You pretty much can't do it. That literally isn't something that your average person ever has to worry about. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, basically what you're referring to is protein sparing modified fast. So for people listening that don't understand that, that's basically keeping protein extremely high and trying to keep both carbs and fat extremely low, which is, which is a, uh, it's, it's an energy deficit, a really big one. And it's not sustainable, especially if you're at a lower body fat percentage. If you're somebody that's like morbidly obese, definitely in bariatrics and obesity medicine, this is something that's used for, you know, periods of time to, to try to accelerate uh, fat loss, but definitely not something that's sustainable for, <laughs> I, I've tried it for, for short periods and um, just eating chicken and broccoli for <laughs> more than a day is <laughs> awful. <laughs> I mean, your body will fix the problem. You'll just end up eating a whole jar of peanut butter. You won't even know how it happened. But that's why humans aren't extinct because you will just absolutely get the calories. So. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about satiety. Like why does p &E diet work? Because I think that, I think that the, the magic really in lifestyle modification is the mental framework involved with, with changing a lot of this stuff because most patients can sit across the clinic table and tell me exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, so like, where's the magic between the people that do it and don't. And I think people think it's some kind of, you know, motivation or something along like that. But I honestly think it's, it's starting with the mental framework and then knowing how to control satiety. Cause I, I'm the girl who like, all I could think about was my next meal. Like that was me like living in like chronic diet world, but it was like, just obsessing, you know, about like, oh, what am I going to eat next? Or what am I going to eat next? So like, how does P&E help with satiety or, you know, the, the balance of these macronutrients? Right. Well, so the overarching principle uh, of the P.E. diet is satiety per calorie. So at the end of the day, every human is eating to satiety. You're basically going to eat until you're not hungry anymore. And the difference between you and somebody who's, you know, 600 pounds is somehow you're eating to satiety and that's less calories than somebody else. Um, when you look closer to the diet, it might be because you're eating, you know, like lean meat and green vegetables and uh, all of this super high protein nutrient dense stuff. And then the 600 pound person is just like Uber eating like banana splits or something like that. That's, um, you know, just carbs and fats mostly. So the whole goal of the, of the PE diet is to do everything to your diet that you possibly can that's evidence-based to improve satiety per calorie. And, and it turns out there's a handful of things that improve satiety per calorie. Number one, protein percentage. That's probably the biggest factor of all. So we have a zillion studies showing that protein percent of the diet is one of the biggest factors when it comes to satiety per calorie. Uh, and then you've got reducing glycemic carbs. We have studies, you know, Dr. Ludwig and uh, some other researchers have uh, published studies showing that a reduction in glycemic carbs definitely improves satiety per calorie. You eat cereal for breakfast, you're going to be way hungrier three to four hours later than if you had eggs, you know what I mean? So um, higher protein percent, reduction in glycemic carbs, reduction in empty calorie fats and refined fats. This is evidence-based to improve satiety per calorie. If uh, you and I both eat chicken and broccoli, but I just pour oil all over it, we're probably going to get the same satiety and I'm going to eat like, you know, an extra couple hundred calories and that's going to add up. So a reduction in fat, reduction in glycemic carbs, increase in protein, increase in fiber. And the whole way you calculate PE diet is protein and fiber minus carbs and fats. So basically 
fiber is helpful when it comes to satiety of calorie. And then you've got stuff like nutrient density and, uh, and energy density. You want to keep nutrient density as high as possible, energy density as low as possible. You add all these up, you've got the PE diet, and you're basically doing everything instead of space to improve satiety of calorie. So you just automatically stop eating at a lower caloric intake, and you're just going to get thinner, basically, if you're overweight. Yeah, yeah, control satiety, and you'll just naturally uh, eat less. Um, back to the fiber for a minute. Is fiber necessary? There's such a debate, uh, you know, like, oh, your microbiome needs it. Uh, oh, it's, you know, overplayed. Obviously, in therapeutic ketosis, it's kind of the same end goal with, you know, production of beta hydroxybutyrate, you know, because fiber goes down into our colon and gets fermented by the bacteria to make short chain fatty acids. So tell me where you where you fall in, in uh, fiber world. Like, how much do we need? Do we really need it? Or is it just for satiety? And there's a lot of things you have to know about fiber. First of all, it's 100% not necessary. You can literally eat no fiber. You will be okay. Uh, secondly, there's definitely such a thing as too much fiber. I mean, you eat 100 grams of fiber a day. Uh, you're going to have gas and bloating and abdominal pain. And if you have anything wrong with your colon, if you have diverticulitis, if you have chronic constipation, if you have ulcerative colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, uh a colectomy god forbid and you're eating a bunch of fiber you're toast i mean this is not going to be pretty so fiber is definitely on this u-shaped curve you can exist on zero but it's not optimal you can eat a ton of it but that's not optimal i mean you definitely don't want to eat a whole bale of hay so there's this sweet spot of the u-shaped curve of fiber that you want to find and it is definitely not zero there's a reason why all of your bodybuilders and your bikini models and your fitness competitors are eating um, fibrous vegetables because they do eke out a little bit more satiety per calorie. And it's going to be individualized. Like you have to feel good. You have to have a, you know, high satiety per calorie, but you also don't want to be bloated and have abdominal pain all the time. So you, everyone has to find that sweet spot for themselves, but uh, fiber is, can be useful and you, what you don't want to do is just like pour psyllium husk on everything you eat or eat a whole bale of hay or just do something ridiculous like that because that is not going to end well. But eating like nutrient dense uh, fruits and vegetables that have fiber in them, I think is very helpful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, talk to me about fats. Like, are all fats created equal? Uh, you know, a lot of people recently think that polyunsaturated fats may be what, you know, drives obesity and inflammation and, and things like that. Talk to us about fats. So <clears throat> fat, you, you definitely don't want to be afraid of whole food fats. And whole food fats are actually kind of low fat foods. Like, uh, you know, like an avocado is only 10 grams of fat per 100 grams of avocado, you know, and a, a salmon is like, 10 grams of fat per 100 grams of salmon. And so these are these have fat in them, but they have so much protein or fiber or water or nutrients or all of the above that they're amazing. And, and if you were avoiding things like avocado and salmon because they're high fat, that's where you really get into the, the trouble of like really low fat diets. You're, you're basically throwing the baby out with the bath water, right? So you don't wanna be afraid of whole food fats. What you don't want is all your refined fat, like oil, 100 grams of oil is 100 grams of fat, and it has zero protein, zero minerals, zero micronutrients, uh, completely empty calories, very easy to passively overconsume because, you know, if you just pour oil over everything, you're going to eat the same amount and you're going to just get a billion extra calories. So it really comes down to how refined and processed the fat is, in my opinion. So I love whole food fats, eggs, avocado, salmon, bring it on, you know, uh, red meat. Love it. I'm not a fan of refined high fat foods like butter, heavy cream, oil, and stuff like that. Um, you kind of asked me about the PUFA debate, and I, I'm really not, I haven't jumped on the bandwagon that's racing through the low carb keto community where PUFAs are just instant death, right? Like it instantly breaks your mitochondria and, may, and it's the cause of all fat. Like the whole linoleic acid fear and the whole poof of fear. I really am not on board with that. What happens is the bulk of refined fats in the modern diet is these PUFA laden soybean oil and yeah. corn oil and vegetable oil. 
And uh, there's so many empty calories there. What, anytime you look at association between increased PUFA and bad stuff, you really can't tease it apart from just the empty calories, which you know is going to create bad stuff. Like anytime you get that many empty calories, you've got this metabolic oversupply and that's going to break your mitochondria and that's going to give you all kinds of problems. And it's very hard to tease out from just, um, you know, eating too much calories in general. And in fact, uh, you know, you can look at studies where they, animal studies where they used butter um, and they generate some of the bad outcomes that you see from soybean oil or poofas too. So I'm really not... I'm not going to say, oh, if it's saturated fat, you can eat all you want, go crazy. But if it's PUFA, you're instantly dead. Like, mm -hmm. I don't buy that. I don't really believe that. I'm pushing back on that a little bit. And I think you really don't want to eat um, too many extra refined fat calories of any kind. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I mean, the the whole food sources, you know, like, I mean, even a ribeye is, you know, gets vilified for saturated fat, but a ribeye actually has about just as much monounsaturated fat as it is saturated fat. I mean, I think whole food is different than, you know, if you're pouring canola oil on, on things, or and I always tell patients, anything that comes in a box, a bag or a jar is almost always going to have cottonseed oil, soybean oil. Like it's crazy. Uh, even like canned whipped cream has canola oil in it. Like they put it in everything. So you just have to be savvy about, you know, looking at labels and things like that and really understanding, you know, what the added ingredients are in the food you're eating. So, um, when it comes to, let's talk about like protein and meat sources for a minute. So with PE diet, obviously, you know, something like a ribeye steak is going to have a lot more fat than, than a chicken breast. So, you know, per meal, is it important, you know, for something lean, like a chicken breast, like is it important to add fat, you know, into those meals or just eat the protein, keep it lean. Right. Like, so if you eat something that's almost no fat at all, like egg whites or whey powder or chicken breast, you're probably not getting enough fat. Uh, but also if you're getting the fattiest grain fed ribeye you can find and adding a, that's been artificially fattened uh, and you uh, cook it in a bunch of butter and pour butter on top of it, then you're definitely blowing out your ratio and that's bad too. So again, it's sort of this U-shaped curve and you want to be somewhere in the middle, you know, like, like lean ground beef is awesome. And uh, chicken breast with the skin on it is awesome. And uh, your uh, wild caught fish and seafood is awesome. And so anything that's, you know, somewhere in the middle is going to be where you want to be. Now you can get the very leanest protein out there and then add fat to it. You could also always cook your chicken breast in butter or make a sauce for it or something. Um, but once you got the fattiest protein there is, it's hard to take the fat away from that. You know what I mean? Like if I have like a artificially fattened pig and I get a pork shoulder from that and cook it and the fat percentage is just super, super high, it's hard to back down from that. So typically the PE approach is to start with the leaner protein because you're probably going to add a bunch of fat too when you cook it, you know, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It adds up quickly for sure. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's shift away from diet and talk a little bit about exercise. How do you, how do you train? So okay, I, I'm a huge fan of intensity. So I, I, I I'm trying to solve the equation for the least time expenditure. Mm -hmm. So I always crank the intensity up as high as I can. Uh, I also do a fairly high frequency as well to minimize the time involvement. So I end up working out every day, super high intensity but very, very brief. So I'll do like a nano workout where I just do one set of push, pull in legs, and then one round of some sort of high intensity cardio. And I might be in and out in like 10 minutes. Mm. Um, so I'm just trying to do these tiny, tiny little workouts. Uh, but I get away with that because the intensity is super high and frequency is super high. Would I get better results if I spent two hours in the gym every day? Yes, but I, but I, it would be such a diminishing return. You know, I would do 90% more work and get 10% more gains. And so I'm really trying to solve the calculus for like biggest return on time investment. Uh, I personally, I'm also trying to just prove that you can do um, fitness without any money in any gym and any equipment. So I don't have a gym. I don't have barbells. I don't have weight machine. I don't have any of this stuff. And I'm just doing body weight resistance, like push-up variations to increase the intensity and the 
difficulty and uh, pull up variations and stuff like this. So like, honestly, it's every day, super high intensity, very short, mostly body weight. And then cardio is sprinting or running or something like that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's just like removing barriers. You could do it anywhere on vacation in a hotel room at the ball field with your kids. Yeah. It's uh, and I'm about efficiency too. Cause I, I only, there's only so many minutes in the day to get everything done. So, <laughs> and I think that's how patients view it is that they're going to have to, you know, be on the treadmill for an hour. Um, and I, I think that's something that people don't under, like they don't understand how, like how to move. Um, they want like some program, but even the most well thought out program is all about execution. Like the only thing that's going to work is like what you'll actually do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you and I are very similar in that, like, I enjoy exercise. Like I, I like that effect. Like I, I definitely get like a dopamine response from it. Um, but I think there are some people that don't and that's, you know, uh, but I think diet is, you know, people always say, I'll like 80% diet, 20% exercise, whatever. I think it's a hundred percent diet. Cause if you can't, I mean, I don't care how much you work out, but if you're eating shit, then <laughs> you're negating all the positive effects. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like you're so right. Like your, your diet is so important, but then again, exercise is pretty important because if you just lay in bed for two weeks, you pretty much can't even walk. So for me, it's just straight down the middle 50, 50, you know what I mean? It's like, you really, you're never going to get to your goals unless you're doing both for sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that is such a huge thing too. And uh, sarcopenia, you know, age related sarcopenia. So like that's loss of your muscle mass as you age and PE diet is great. Right. I always say meat and weights, like get the amino acids in, get the stimulus from the resistance training and then get out, <laughs> get in and get yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, a common question that I get from a lot of listeners, uh, like what labs, should people be asking their doctor for on an annual basis? I find people are like, oh, my doctor doesn't even think I should like check a A1C or a fasting insulin or like what labs do you recommend people know their numbers on on an annual basis? So I'm a little bit weird about blood testing. Like, I, you know, I, I have some functional medicine training, uh, but a lot of the lab tests that uh, people ask me for end up just not being that value added. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I have patients come in and they want a billion tests. They want advanced lipid testing. They want all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, it's still like protein and lifting. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm basically not doing anything with these results except saying, Oh, your health sucks and you need to, go do some pull-ups right now. You know what I mean? Like go, go eat some protein and do your pull-ups right now. And so I, I don't do a ton of lab testing just because I don't find a lot of it to be value added. Uh, I like, I personally don't do a lot of testing frequently because I, you know, just how you look and feel is honestly very important, I think. Um, however, having said that, I think there are some basic labs that I highly recommend that are helpful uh, I love a uh, good fasting lipid panel and I'm mostly looking at fasting triglycerides. Mm -hmm. So I love, love, love fasting triglycerides. This is fat energy in your bloodstream that, uh, if it's high, it has no place to go because your fat cells are all full, right? As your fat cell, as your adipocytes start reaching their maximum diameter and you struggle to sprout any new ones, uh, your triglycerides just circulate and they never have any place to go versus someone who's super thin their their fat cells are deflated they have plenty of headroom for storing their fat cells they also are doing high intensity exercise lots of uh depletion of intramuscular triglycerides they have tons of place to put triglycerides they can put triglycerides in their fat cells in their muscle and uh, when they eat food and the triglycerides go up in their bloodstream, all of these cells just hoover the triglycerides right out on the first pass. And even like a oral fat tolerance test, these people are going to have very low triglycerides. Their fasting triglycerides are going to be very low. So I love fasting triglycerides. <clears throat> you absolutely want to be under 100. If you're over 100, you've probably got a problem. If you're over about a 115, you have full-blown insulin resistance. You really want to be under 70 to be elite. And this is an extremely useful test. 
Um, I like the hemoglobin A1C, like I do A1Cs on everyone, you know, now that 52% of adult Americans are pre-diabetic or diabetic, basically everybody needs an A1C. So I love fasting lipids. I'm looking at triglycerides predominantly, triglycerides to HDL ratio secondarily. Um, and then A1C I think is extremely useful. And if you have low triglycerides and a low A1C, you're pretty much done. You really don't need anything else. Yeah. Um, I used to be a big fan of fasting insulin levels, but I'm doing this less and less because there, there's a lot of, um, those tend to like jump around quite a bit. Like if, if you just, um, were super hyper hypocaloric for a couple of days, you might pull down a really low, really low insulin level. But if you went to the buffet for three days in a row and just massively overate, you can easily double your fasting insulin in just a few days of over or under eating. So I find that to be less useful. I like things that are more long-term. A1C is a lot more long-term. Waist circumference is uh, really long. Waist circumference is the best long-term measurement we've got, you know, to be honest. So um, I frequently do, do fasting insulin levels just because it bounces around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about uh, normal triglycerides? I just had to look what my, my last uh, triglycerides were 47. <laughs> that's beautiful. See, that's epic. That's, that's exemplary. That's spectacular. And, you know, and you pair that with a high HDL, which I'm sure you've got, and you're basically just killing it. Yeah. Let's look what my HDL was. So, cause I mean, the, the question I wanted to talk about was, I get patients who, you know, have been low carb and they've reversed their insulin resistance and they're off their blood pressure medication. Uh, but on their lipid panel, their triglycerides are low, HDL is high and their LDL is high and their primary care is, you know, wanting to talk to them about statin therapy. And so this is a, a you know, common question that I get. Yeah. My HDL was 64 and my, but see, I'm the person who my, my LDL is 95. So like, and I eat a ton of beef and, you know, eggs and, and my LDL is 95, but I get these patients with an LDL of, you know, 170. What do you do in these situations? Like, do you recommend coronary artery calcium scans? Like, is it individualized? Like, well, first of all, we really don't know what to do with these people, right? <clears throat> this is a data-free zone. We really don't know what to do with people who are super metabolically healthy, who have low, uh, very low, you know, sub one triglyceride to HDL ratio, and then crazy high total on LDL cholesterol. Uh, we, we do know that probably if everything else remains the same, it might be better to have lower total on LDL cholesterol, but should we really be worried about it when everything else is awesome? I don't know. So, you know, if you look at every single risk factor for cardiovascular disease, if you look at uh, family history, waist circumference, smoking, diabetes, uh, blood sugar, cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, triglyceride to HDL ratio, cholesterol to HDL ratio, APOB, lipoprotein A, if you rank out every single risk factor, the very highest one is diabetes by a mile. It's like a 20x multiplier. Like you're just going to, you know, 75% of all diabetics drop dead of a massive heart attack for sure. Mm -hmm. Like diabetes is for we physicians, it's a coronary artery disease equivalent. It's a coronary equivalent. You know, everyone with diabetes has coronary disease. It's probably going to die of a giant heart attack. You're just waiting for it to happen. But then way, way, way down at the very, very, very bottom is LDL cholesterol, where it's like the very smallest risk factor of all. It's maybe a 1.3x risk um, multiplier. So even already, it's one of the lowest risk factors of all. And then when you've got these, you know, Dave Feldman, lean mass hyper responders who everything else is awesome and they just have a high LDL, I don't know how worried about that I need to be. I'm, I'm usually not super terrified. Um, frequently, I'll do a CT coronary calcium score. And if people pull down a zero, I'm really, really not worried about it. Um, I will say that it's possible to lower your LDL quite a bit. And the number one thing you can do to lower LDL is add back in some carbs. So you throw 100 grams of carbs at somebody and just drop their fat by 50 grams to keep it isochloric, and boom, your LDL is going to drop in half. Like most people, that'll just collapse their, their super high total in LDL. And I don't know if that really makes you healthier or not, but that's something you can at least do about it. The other thing is cut way back on refined, artificially concentrated saturated fat from like butter and heavy cream 
and cheese and the fattiest grain fed ribeyes you can find. You cut back on all of these and that's also going to drop your LDL, not as much as adding carbs back in, but significantly. So like myself, I was a lean mass hyper responder with super high total LDL and I just cut back on, you know, I, you know, I cook with like an avocado oil spray now instead of butter. Um, I, the only cheese I eat is low fat cheese. Um, I don't have heavy cream in my fridge at all. And so like, I just made these small tweaks, you know, and uh, now my LDL is super low and my total is super low. So, uh, and, I, and I also had to add in, you know, I eat about hundred to 150 grams of carbs a day based on how active I am or how much cardio I'm doing. And by doing all these things, you can really drop your cholesterol and LDL. Are you actually healthier as a result? I don't know, but maybe, you know, this is yeah. unfortunately an evidence-free zone. So we're just kind of flying blind here. Yeah, I think Dave Feldman's actually recruiting for a study uh, currently. And so it will be interesting. You know, it will be interesting as we get more studies on carnivore diet and, you know, looking at LDL. Um, sometimes I'll use advanced lipid panels, you know, look at their CRP, look at their APOB and, and other things like that. But I'm with you a lot of times, uh, you know, based off their family history or I'll get a CAC and it's zero. And then I'm like, yeah, we don't, you know, have a lot to worry about. Your blood pressure is normal. Your triglycerides are normal. Like I can't find anything wrong with you except this. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, so, um, do you use any sort of like body fat testing or do you just use waist circumference? Like, um, uh, personally and professionally, I don't do any kind of body fat testing except for calipers. Like I have a set of calipers in the office and if somebody wants me to, I can caliper them and get body fat. Uh, same thing for myself. You know, I have like an impedance scale. I have calipers, uh, but I've never actually even done a DEXA scan or any of these advanced techniques. And honestly, uh, I feel like it doesn't really add anything to the equation. I mean, most of the time, just how you look naked is what counts. And let's face it, even in bodybuilding competitions, it's all just a hundred percent visual. Like nobody cares what your DEXA is. Nobody cares what your bod pod is. Right. Nobody cares what your dunk tank is. So why should I care? I kind of don't. It's for most people, it's waist circumference, but it is cool to track with something, even if it's wildly inaccurate. So like your impedance scale, tracking with that is way better than nothing. It will change up and down more or less, you know, in according to how your body fat changes, same thing with calipers, it will go up and down as you get fatter or leaner. So those are kind of cool. Yeah. And women, I just like, I hate using the scale because it never tells the whole story. And in a menstruating woman, it could be up and down multiple pounds day to day, hour to hour. So I just, it's such a horrible metric, but, uh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what's the, what's the biggest barrier that your patients face for making these changes? Oh, wow. I would say it's probably the addictive nature of hedonically rewarding foods. So like the high energy density carbs and fats together are so tasty. People are addicted to them. Like uh, cheap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you know, your cakes and your cookies and your pies and your muffins and your crackers and your bagels and your uh, candy bars and your, um, you know, like uh, you're, the, this food is so rewarding and it spikes so much dopamine in your brain that it's literally addictive. And so that's basically half of the entire obesity epidemic right there. Um, the first half is protein dilution. So like if you're, if you're not smart enough to know that the protein's been diluted out of your diet with carbs and fats, you're just going to radically overeat calories trying to get enough protein to not be hungry and you just don't know any better. That's half of the obesity epidemic. That one is instantly solved when people read the PE diet, right? You read that and you're like, holy crap, I'm surrounded by this low protein food like garbage. It's just massively protein diluted from refined carbs and refined fats. It's all just sugar, flour, and oil. No wonder I'm eating an extra thousand calories a day trying to not be hungry with my box of Triscuits from like wheat flour and soybean oil. But the other half of the obesity epidemic is this, we call it the trifecta in the book. It's foods that are high carb, high fat, high energy density. It's your candy bar and your, uh, you know, donut. I mean, this stuff is so tasty. If you didn't have it in your food environment, you'd be fine. You just, you, you just eat your steak and eggs and your, 
you know, whatever, and you'd be great. But since it's everywhere, you literally can't escape it. It's just, a, that's, I would say that's the biggest piece for most of my patients who already know what to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the carbs that you do eat, you know, you mentioned you might eat 100, 150. What, what are you eating for carbs? Is it rice? Is it fruit? What is it? it it's mostly fruit. So I eat a a ton of low sugar fruit like cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers and olives and avocados but i'm also eating some higher sugar fruit like apples and melon and uh, <clears throat> uh citrus and that sort of thing and so i would say a lot of my calories my carbohydrates are coming from fruit i do also occasionally eat some like tubers potatoes uh maybe even some rice maybe some low carb high fiber bread um, maybe some popcorn, some stuff like that. It's basically fruit, vegetables, tubers, and grains. So for people with insulin resistance or prediabetes or diabetes, do you think it's helpful to keep those lower for a period of time until you fix the insulin resistance, add them back in, see what your threshold is? Like, do you ever monitor? I mean, and it's so hard to correct for glycemic excursions, you know, when you're eating carbs, you might want to really end uh, aim for the lower end of that carb spectrum. If you're, uh, if you require a ketogenic diet for a neurologic reason, you know, you really might want to end, uh, end up at the very, very lower end where you're just getting your carbs from non-starchy vegetables like salad and stuff like that. Um, versus if you're completely metabolically healthy and you're just doing a ton of lifting and cardio, you could eat way more carbs. You could basically eat all the fruit you want. Like, you know, uh, just, you know, fruit's not that bad. I mean, to get, you know, a hundred grams of carbs from strawberries, you have to eat four pounds of strawberries. It's basically impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Um, to get 2000 calories from potatoes, you have to eat, you know, five pounds of boiled potatoes it's like obscene like you can't even do it you're literally going to just stop eating so for people who uh can handle the glycemic excursions uh i say go for it you know you can probably going to be fine with uh you know even uh higher quantities of this but you're right there are some people who are going to want to stay on the lower carb side of things and that's people with dangerously high sugar and type 1 diabetes and people who need to drink keto and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I always say you have to be your own expert and just, you know, figure out how you feel and function best. And I always tell people, listen, nobody got diabetes from blueberries and carrots. Okay. That's not how you develop diabetes. So, uh, you know, those, those whole food sources have, have, uh, other nutrients. I'm with you. Do you ever recommend supplementing? I just, this world is crazy. Like I have patients that come in with a backpack of stuff and I'm like, okay, well, the first thing we're gonna do is stop all of these. But is there anything that you think that most people do benefit from or can you get it off from your diet? Uh, um, I, I personally, I'm not a huge supplement fan. I hardly ever recommend supplements. You can mostly get it all from your diet. There's uh, very few exceptions. You know, if you're a plant-based vegetarian vegan, yeah, okay, I want you to take B12 and zinc and iron and uh, if you're not eating a bunch of meat, you know, you might want to take all sorts of, you know, uh, supplements. You might want to, uh, basically take B12 and carnitine and anything that you're not getting enough of. If you're, um, <clears throat> a strict carnivore, you might want to take some folate or, uh, magnesium or both of those. Uh, if you don't eat fish, you might want to take fish oil. If you live way up here in the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> like I do, you, and you're, you're darkly skin pigmented, you're going to have a vitamin D deficiency. You might want to mm-hmm. supplement vitamin D. Um, so th- there are some like case by case uh, people that I will recommend supplementation for, but your average person living at a uh, genetically reasonable latitude for their skin type probably doesn't need any supplements at all. If you're an omnivore and you're living at the right latitude, you pretty much just eat a healthy diet and you should never need any supplements at all. Like personally, I do not take any supplements at all ever. Yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of, of less supplementation. They're expensive and it's like another thing you have to remember to do. Uh, yeah. Vitamin D we do in Nebraska. Yeah. We're not even Northwest, but we, our vitamin D levels peak here in like August, September. And I've seen some atrocious vitamin D levels just even in the last month, which is terrifying in the world of 
of COVID and things like that. People with, I just had a gal with a vitamin D level of like 17. <laughs> yeah. Scary stuff. Scary stuff. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to let you get back to unpacking. So tell people where they can find information about the PE diet, where they can find you if they wanted to become your patient. Got it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I wrote this book, uh, with William Shufelt and it's called the PE diet and you can get it at the PE diet. Um, you can also buy it anywhere books are sold online, you know, Amazon and that sort of thing. <clears throat> you can check me out on social media. I'm on Twitter at Ted Naiman, Instagram at Ted Naiman. Uh, unfortunately, my medical practice is close to new patients. I only see people in person here in the Seattle area and uh, my practice is closed. So you basically can't work with me one on one. But um, yeah, all my good advice is probably in the book anyway. So I don't know how helpful it would even be to see me in person. I'd just be like, Hey, you need to eat protein and start lifting. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, that's incredible. All right. Well go, uh, go check out Dr. Name and yeah, he's, he's active on social media. That's how, that's how we got connected. And, uh, I dove into the PE diet uh, a couple years ago when I was adding a lot more protein. Uh, I added resistance training back, back in like 2018, 2019, and then started really increasing my protein. And I'm a huge fan of protein and a huge fan of resistance training for women because women are afraid to have muscles. And I've got three little girls upstairs. I can hear them running around so that I don't ever want them to grow up and, and be afraid of being strong because it's uh, muscle is definitely an organ of longevity. So all right. Well, Dr. Naaman, thank you so much. Thank you guys for tuning in to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Make sure you download this episode, leave us your reviews and your comments, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate you all so much. Have a great day.